He was famous everywhere. He was the best, the champion, the greatest in any stadium. He was also the worst person on earth. And if need be, the Hand of God incident proved it. In football, there's a before and after Maradona, just like the period before and after the Second World War. Maradona epitomized the mystique of the working class revolution, aloof and arrogant like the 1980s. During the 80s, Maradona was the first big icon of the era when football became a globally televised phenomenon. that Maradona has been able to do. And it was under the constant barrage of TV cameras and satellites that he expressed his timeless talent. He had that magic, that special something that makes you realize that you're dealing with something out of this world, the likes of which will never be seen again. The most important characters in mythology were Apollo and Dionysus. Apollo represented reason and Dionysus represented emotion. Those who knew Maradona understand that he was the worst of Apollo, but the best of Dionysus. He's still a child and already he's a god. Maradona is 20 years old. He plays for Argentinos Juniors. Hugo Gatti, Boca Juniors goalkeeper, they call him El Loco, crazy guy. He teases Maradona, you're like a little fat barrel, you'll never score against me. Diego replies on the pitch, starting with a penalty and then with a lethal free kick from a wide position. At the start of the second half, Maradona does even better and perfects his performance by scoring twice in the space of two minutes. First, all alone in front of Gatti, he scores his third with a soft left foot touch. Then he leaves everyone behind and is fouled inside the box. He's only awarded a free kick, but it's enough for the little fat barrel to humiliate Gatti with his fourth goal on the night. Argentinos win 5-3. Yes, Diego is already a god, and he's still just a child. Diego Armando was born on the 30th of October 1960. The Maradona family includes 10 people, father, mother and eight siblings. He lives in a three-room house in Villa Fiorito, a suburb of Buenos Aires. There weren't many kids in Villa Fiorito who had their own football. But sometimes we miraculously made one out of some wool or, or anything else that could somehow be shaped into a ball. 
we played our little match and the kid who brought the ball was the star because none of us had one. Impromptu gambling takes place around these early suburban matches. Diego plays on the battered fields in his area and joins the Argentinos Juniors youth team Cebolitas. They go unbeaten for 136 matches. It was all new to me, because where I came from we had no ball, no shoes. For me it was a little bit like Disney World. I'd never seen so many footballs in one place. It was there that I started to train, and immediately I realized that I could keep the ball up forever. <laughs> Now that's the thing I can tell you, that I can remember. I was training and always thinking that I had to do more. Now this helped me when I eventually started playing for real. He's already popular as a kid. He's shown on TV juggling the ball. He delights the crowd with his tricks during the first team's matches halftime break. The daily newspaper Clarin writes about him, mistakenly calling him Caradona. He makes his first division debut with Argentinos Juniors. He isn't 16 yet. Four months later, he's already part of the national team. The national manager, Cesar Luis Menotti, leaves him out of the team for the 1978 World Cup. It's a trauma for Diego, the first big rejection of his life. I'm convinced I could have played in 1978. It was pointless Menotti telling me that I had a bright future and that I was going to play a lot of other matches, a lot of World Cups. I've played in four of them, but I really missed that one in Argentina. But he gets his own back one year later in Japan at the World Cup for the under-20s. Under the guidance of the same Flaco Menotti, Maradona inspires the Argentine national team to victory. Argentina's number 10 shows the world his outstanding repertoire of skills. Great speed, majestic ball control on the move, sudden changes of pace and direction, breathtaking dribbling even when under pressure, a great skill in moving into the right position and earning free kicks. In the final against the Soviet Union, Argentina win 3-1 and Diego scores from a free kick. He is voted best player of the competition. It's his first major achievement. Maradona moves to Boca Juniors in 1981. Joining this team is a dream come true for him, as like his father before him, he has supported the club all his life and he refuses a sizeable offer from the Richmond's club, River Plate, just so that he can wear the beloved blue and yellow shirt. On his debut, he scores from the spot and the El Grafico newspaper writes, today, in the whole world, Maradona is football. When I was fit, I could do anything. Now, you can't learn creativity. It just comes out by itself. Maradona's magic bewitches the Bombonera Stadium. Boca paid the astronomical price of $10 million to enjoy the weekly delight of Diguito's mesmerizing rungs. It's an expensive contract for the club and they try to sustain it by playing friendlies all over the place with strict contracts imposing the number 10's presence on the field, as he is by now a superstar of world-class stature. He's Argentinian, has seven brothers and is priceless. The Boca Junior, the most famous club in Buenos Aires, risks bankruptcy as a result of having acquired him a few months ago. In fact, every evening, the club earns $100,000 or more per evening to show off its masterpiece.
Already the league's top scorer, while at Argentinos Juniors, Maradona does it again with Boca. The Metropolitan League 1981 thrives on the rivalry between Boca and River, who've reacted by buying Mario Kempes, star of the national team. One night on a muddy pitch, the two historical rivals play an unforgettable derby at the Bombonera. It's the 10th of April 1981, the 10th minute of the second half. Boca turn around a River Plate attack. Maradona descends on the ball like lightning. He steals the ball and starts running really fast upfield. He's fouled, gets right back up like a spring and continues unstoppable. Goes past another man and asks for a quick one-two. The goalkeeper, Fiol, temporarily breaks down Boca's attack, but the ball stays in the box. It's 1-0. Diego offers spectacular demonstrations of his talent. He's impossible to catch and totally unpredictable. Thirty minutes have gone by when he scores the last goal, leaving goalkeeper Fiol on his knees and defender Tarantini hopelessly scrambling on the floor, these being two of Argentine's football's most revered players. The Bombonera is delirious about this 3-0 victory. Diego wins his first league title. At the end of the season, he says something important. People have to realize that I'm not a machine for happiness. In 1982, Maradona moves to Spain. His stay there is difficult and not without contradictions. Gossip about Diego's private life starts there. He shoots an advert against drugs and at the same time starts using cocaine and becomes addicted. It's there that this evil vice takes hold, something that will affect his entire life. The first season has many ups and downs, among these his fraught relationship with German manager Udo Lattek and discovering he has hepatitis. His only consolation is one in the Copa del Rey and a malicious goal against Real Madrid. A solitary run at goal, dribbling around the keeper, the goal is clear. Maradona has no hurry. He waits for the defender, Juan Jose, just to tease him with another dummy that sends him crashing against the post. The next season is even worse. On the 24th of September 1983, a murderous tackle from Athletic Bilbao's Anthony Goigoychea fractures a bone in his ankle, also ripping his ligaments apart. This vicious attack by the Basque player is an obvious sign of the widespread hostility against him that he faces all across Spain. But Maradona doesn't give up. He enters the operating theatre with a smile on his face and comes out of it with the proud intention of coming back stronger than ever. Doctors in Barcelona foresee at least six months out of action. Diego does it his way. He hires the Argentine doctor Ruben Dario Oliva and goes back home to Buenos Aires to recuperate. His comeback is almost miraculous. After just over 100 days, on the 8th of January 1984, he's back on the pitch during Barcelona Seville and his left foot has lost none of its magical qualities. He's already decisive, scoring two goals. but it's Real Madrid who win the Liga. His Catalan experience ends on a sour note with a defeat in the Copa del Rey final against Athletic Bilbao and a furious outbreak of violence in front of King Juan Carlos. That's how he gets his own back against Goicoechea.
In the summer of 1984, Maradona moves to Italy. Corrado Ferlaino, Napoli's chairman, invests 14 billion of the old lira and manages to beat Juventus' competition and buy the Piba de Oro. Diego doesn't really know the true situation of this team, who during the season before had avoided relegation by just one point. But the city of Naples knows him, and 70,000 fans are ready to welcome him in his first match, oblivious to the fact that the Argentine is already on the pitch, having fun in front of a few fortunate spectators. His first shot at goal at the San Paolo Stadium already seems like a winning wager. A skillful display among a group of kids. But the deal is much bigger than that, and this is just the beginning. Maradona is a Neapolitan. The fact that he was born in Argentina doesn't mean a thing. Those who knew Maradona know he was born in Naples. The first few months aren't easy. At half-season, Diego has scored six goals in 15 matches, but Napoli, under the guidance of Rino Marchese, are facing relegation. Maradona finally wins everybody over on the 24th of February 1985, when he scores three goals against the unfortunate Orsi in Napoli Lazio. Only great players can score such goals, making us all dream. Only the league winners Verona put together more points in the second part of the season. Maradona is third top scorer with 14 goals behind Platini and Altobelli. During the 85-86 season, Napoli keeps up the good form displayed in the latter part of the season before and ends up in third position. The Pibe is extraordinary against Verona, inventing a goal that had never been seen before at the San Paolo and never will be seen again. The goal is the thing you celebrate. It's what keeps you going during the week. The end result of all the training. The fruit of all your labours. But you can't say that it's the only important thing, going out on the pitch. Just going on the pitch itself makes you feel different. Going out on the pitch is the best thing of all. He was used to leaving the dressing room last. We were already in the tunnel when he arrived, and then he made everyone at ease by shaking everybody's hand. He started on the first step and climbed them all in the San Paolo Stadium tunnel, greeting everyone. He used to thank every other player beforehand which motivated you because it gave you great responsibility. You feel like you're part of history, the history of football. Mm, those scents that I left a long time ago but that I haven't forgotten. No, 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 no. The fans waited for his precise rituals, the way he put his left foot first on the pitch, his sign of the cross, and that incredible superstitious kiss he gave to the team physio Carmando before each and every match. And then a few yards before entering the pitch, a nice shout to spur everybody on. On the 3rd of November 1985, Platini's Juventus arrive at the San Paolo. For Napoli, it's like an exam to see if they can really aspire to become a great team. Eight matches, eight wins. The domination by Juventus is at risk of ruining the league. Hence the latest and heartfelt call. Everybody with Maradona. Perhaps it'll be the last call, but this time it's directed towards an ace who knows all about magic. Will it be enough? The league can only hope so. Mm. 
Napoli Juve is a tense affair at first. Everyone is nervous. During the second half, Maradona really starts to shine and carries the team, creating dangers in every way. He sets up the play, then he goes inside the box, ready to head the ball among Juventus' giant defenders. He even shoots with his right foot. Juve never have a shot at goal, not even Platini's free kicks can trouble Guerrilla. Around 20 minutes from the end, the decisive moment. I was supposed to play in that match from the start, but I'd hurt myself during the week. I was just a kid, and that was an unforgettable day. I was on the sidelines. The best thing I ever saw Diego do was the year before I joined the team. Indirect free kick, heavy pitch, heavy ball. The wall was too near and there was no space to put the ball through. I was positioned in the middle. Pecci's pass and he didn't want to pass it to me because he was saying, how can you strike from here? He was very near. When the shot goes in, there's an unbelievable lack of free space. <laughs> Something I've never seen in my long career, in many years of football. I've never seen anything like that goal. The ninth match of the championship has not brought luck to Juventus. Beethoven's ninth and the Neapolitans, yes, allow us this musical triumph, but not for Juve, who are used to winning, but for Napoli, who are not. So we dedicate this ode to joy to the Neapolitans. For Napoli, beating Juventus meant saving the whole season. Between knocks given and taken, Maradona was, by his own admission, the major disappointment of the 1982 World Cup. Four years later, in Mexico, Diego starts the tournament with a few physical problems. In Argentina, not many believe he'll really deliver for the national team this time around. The goal he scored against Galli is very similar to one he scored against him during the previous season's Napoli Fiorentina. Having scored just that once, Maradona arrives at the quarter-final against England, a match that is charged with political undertones and tensions. Only four years earlier, the two countries had gone to war over the Falkland Malvinas Islands. When it's time to enter the pitch, many feel that the future of the Argentine team rests upon only one man. Maradona is a player of exceptional talent, confirmed the England manager Bobby Robson. But the match isn't between England and Maradona, it's between England and Argentina, and it would be an awful mistake to let ourselves be obsessed with a single player, no matter how dangerous he can be. It's the sixth minute of the second half. The score is still nil-nil. That's creativity, and you can see the creativity. Now, people didn't realize that I'd hit it with my hand. Now, Shilton didn't realize. He was just angry because he'd let in a goal. But I don't think that I disrespected the game of football scoring that goal. No. 
I, I really don't. On many occasions, Maradona used his hands on the football pitch. Sometimes these outrageous gestures translate into victories, like at Udinese playing against Zico when the referee allows the goal to stand. Even more outrageous is a match against Sampdoria at home when no one notices the trick, not even the pundits after watching the footage back on replays, they even have words of praise for his low diving header. And going back in time, it was during that famous Boca River derby that Maradona first tried the trick he then perfected against Shilton. Well, perhaps other players wouldn't have tried reaching beyond their heads, whereas when I couldn't reach with my head, I tried with my hand. It's something you can practice. Four minutes after scoring with his hand, Maradona scores the most astonishing goal ever scored in the history of the World Cup. I saw that Valdano was staying on the left and I could see their, their last man at the back but I just kept going with the ball and Valdano was my only distraction because the other player just couldn't be on Maradona's mind. I had to look at both of them. And my clear objective was the keeper. A goal like that. A goal I'd dreamed about all my life came out by chance, right then, during the World Cup. Now, before that, I'd played so many games in Italy, in Argentina, and all over the world, and I was never able to score a goal like that. In 79, we'd been to play at Wembley, the world's most important stadium. And I almost scored a similar goal starting from midfield. When the keeper came out, uh, it was Clements and not Shilton back then. Came out in the same way Shilton did at the World Cup. I hit the ball with the outside of my left foot towards the far post. <laughs> when I got back home, my younger brother asked me, why didn't you dribble round the keeper? And I said, look, I, I did my best. No, you had the time, he said, and the space to go round the keeper too. Now that advice from my little brother stayed in my mind. However, in the World Cup, I remembered about it only after scoring, when I was celebrating the goal. I guess it must have been at the back of my mind all along, though. For many Argentinians, a victory over England is a joyous way of coming to terms with the military defeat of the Falklands War. In that case, my government, the government of Argentina, had been wrong. But the way the British slaughtered our men in the Malvinas, uh, every one of us, well, we had a special motivation inside. I was the one who defeated them, and I was very happy about that, I swear. 
<laughs> I really loved it. Mi è piaciuto molto. Diego also dominates the semi-final against Belgium. We don't have a Maradona on our team, and that's the difference. If Maradona played for Belgium, we'd have won 2-0. I have two dreams. The first is to play in the World Cup, and the second is to win it. Lothar Matthäus's man-to-man marking in the final at the Azteca Stadium prevents Maradona from scoring against the Germans. But it's Diego's ball for Buruchaga that finally breaks the deadlock with the two teams at two all. So Diego Maradona in 1986 is the first and only player in the history of football to win a World Cup all on his own. Pelé won three times, but he did have the support of a great Brazilian side. I remember when Maradona came back from that World Cup. We were already away for pre-season training. Now he arrived pretty late at night, around midnight, and I distinctly remember we all stayed awake to welcome and congratulate him. We celebrated by eating a freezing cold watermelon. Bianchi, our manager, arrived at midnight and he didn't have a clue what was going on. Maradona's new season as World Cup winner starts at Brescia with a goal straight out of those days in Mexico, as it's an almost exact copy of one he'd scored against Belgium. Napoli starts off reasonably well, but only with the purchase of Francesco Romano in October, the whole team starts to really fly. Ottavio Bianchi positions him in front of the defence with Bagni and De Napoli to balance the rhomboid-shaped formation with the free-roaming genius of Maradona at the other end. I believe the important thing there was tactical balance, strengthening and compacting the defence, making it one with the midfield, reaching a balance between these two sectors and the creativity up front. Well, all the managers I've had, they never said, stay on the left or they didn't say stay on the right or, or stay in the middle. They always uh, let me play more or less as I preferred, as I wanted. never gotten much advice from managers. But sometimes when I did receive it, I took it on board because uh, it was something new for me. Napoli are in first place after the first part of the season and with four games to go, they only have two points more than Inter Milan. A string of poor results make the outcome of the season less certain than before. The match against AC Milan is the one that can tell if the team has resolved its doubts and also the psychological problems of its leader. 
Italy has concentrated on him lately with that slightly morbid curiosity that comes when heroes waver and go through a rough patch. The latest Maradona, a nervous and irritable man, tired and lacking in confidence, prone to polemic and insults, is the focus point of this Sunday's match. The whole city of Naples is behind him. The crowd of 90,000 with a record gate of 1,863,000,000 lira is with him all the way and he repays his crowd with a series of feints and moves from his bag of tricks. The first half is of the Naples supporters. At the 43rd minute, a magic moment arrives. Before I got the ball, I already knew what I had to do, where the other team's weaknesses were and how to exploit them. I was quite good at this. A player, when he stops the ball, has to know that by stopping it, he has to keep the flow of the play going. It's the most precious quality a player can have. There are many players who need to stop the ball, then look at the ball. He managed to stop the ball while pressed by two defenders, shift it from foot to foot and score with a young Maldini on his trail. <laughs> In Italy, I learned the art of the winning goal, the three-point goal, that goal that gives you relief, the relief of being safe. I was one of the first to hug Diego. That was a Napoli team that was becoming great and beating AC Milan meant a lot to us. It allowed us to dream big and to think of the ultimate objective which perhaps went beyond simply winning that match. That victory for us meant winning the league. The Yankees team starts out on a sure foot, ending up in first place on the last match. On the 10th of May 1987, Napoli are mathematically certain to win the league for the first time in the club's history. On that day, the first miracle happens. Maradona becomes the non-religious patron saint of the city, worshipped by the people alongside his religious counterpart, San Gennaro. The hearts of the Neapolitans were beating at 100 miles an hour. It was total chaos. I think this is the greatest celebration I've ever lived in my life. In my country, there's no such devotion from the football fans. It was essentially a love story. What does Naples mean to you at this point? Seconda mamma mia, grazie di chiamare mi figlio, adesso che ti sto vicino, grazie per tutto il bene che mi vuoi. Nineteen eighty seven eighty eight, Napoli strengthened their attack by buying Antonio Carreca. Now, spectacular play becomes the norm. Careca joined us, and you can imagine what they could do up front. Careca, Giordano, the renowned magical trio. The team, in its first season after winning the league, is a goal machine firing on all cylinders. Maradona becomes top scorer, behind him is teammate Careca. It was like a pinball machine, a skillful pinball machine. The ball traveled quickly all around through some fabulously skillful play, really. The league looks like a Napoli monologue. Napoli are alone at the top after three games 
and always keep a reassuring distance from the other teams. The second title in a row seems inevitable. The second title is certain by now, can we say that? Oh, we can't say that, but we did play a tremendous match today. Near the end of the season, Napoli are out of breath. Maradona's goal isn't enough to win away at the Bentegodi Stadium in Verona. So we come to the match against rivals AC Milan with four weeks to go and just one point's advantage. Saki's team is in great shape, despite Maradona momentarily equalising with a free kick, Gullit, Virdis and Van Basten have wide open spaces available to finish them off. This match will be talked about for a long time due to the Camorra's alleged influence in forcing Napoli to lose because of goings-on in the illegal gambling business. Too many things have been said and some were very cruel too, but the truth from someone who was there on the pitch that day is that they were in great shape and we simply weren't. Napoli get their revenge against AC Milan during the 88-89 season, and they do so by winning 4-1, a result humiliating not so much because of the high score itself, but because of the way Maradona scored his one goal. An absurd feat, a cartoonish joke with the short player inventing a lob to go past the keeper Galli with his head from outside the box, a goal that no one could ever even conceive. We were in the A curve of the stadium sector when we played AC Milan at home. Maradona was able to anticipate the keeper and get the ball over him, but ever so slowly. And we were there behind the goal, almost calling the ball towards us. Come on, come on. It was a real collective orgasm. I was watching from ground level and there were these incredible seven or eight seconds with the ball going slowly towards the goal, almost wheeled on by the crowd in the San Paolo. Even if it had stopped, they would have been able to make it go in. When Kripa put me through, I thought I'd be able to stop the ball and dribble it around Galli. The ball bounces and stays up over me. Now this surprises me and I, I stay put on the spot just as Galli's running out to get it with his hands. So then I did this almost sly little move because I was either going to hit it with my hand or with my head. In 1989, Inter Milan win the league. Napoli are second and they make up for it in Europe in the UEFA Cup. Napoli reached the quarterfinals and beat Juventus in an all-Italian derby, with the team from Turin, having won the home game 2-0 at the Comunale Stadium, collapsing after extra time thanks to goals from Maradona, Carnevale and Renica. In the next round, Diego inspires his forward teammates to a 2-0 win against the German team Bayern and then travels to German soil and offers a spectacular show even before the match begins. In Germany they had this thing. They had a ball juggler who entertained the crowd before the match. So Diego saw him juggling the ball and basically told him now I'll show you what I can do. There were 10 of us players, all tense and worried. And then there was Diego, who was just relaxed and juggling the ball and smiling. I still don't know how he kept so relaxed just before an important match like that. I, uh, I made myself the most relaxed, and happiest guy in the world. You'd see him warming up and dribbling the ball, juggling the ball, and then it hit you. How does he do it? Sometimes I was in the middle of it, and he never once dropped the ball. I was all tense, and he was calm and serene. Sometimes he was even smiling or dancing. That's Diego for you, and he was like that before every match he was. I don't... I didn't behave that way to say, look at what I'm doing. I did it all to say, I'm here, I'm here. This is what I can do. He wanted to release the tension in our side and at the same time raise the tension in the opposing team. 
alla squadra avversaria. When I warmed up, I did it with the ball. I did all that the others near me weren't able to do. I like being myself, and my teammates, they all looked at me. It was good for the whole team. He made you believe that you were even stronger. He made you feel more important when you saw him warm up. You'd see his inner strength, and so you too became stronger. Because they, Bagni or Ferrara or the keeper, they passed the ball as hard as they could. And I controlled it. And that was like a run at goal. They stayed near me and my warm-up, and they tested me. Now that was the strength of the whole team. I didn't do too much in my warm-up. I just wanted the ball. I wanted to check that I was on the ball. Possessing charisma and mental power only found in the great Muhammad Ali before him, Maradona begins to fight and win even before he goes out onto the pitch. But like Ali, Maradona is not just a clown or someone who mouths off. The pedigree and the authority of a true star shine brightest during the actual sporting event itself. After the linesman disallows a goal by Diego due to offside, Napoli qualifier thanks to two of his enlightening passes to Careca. In the final, there is another German team to beat. This time is Stuttgart, a very sticky opponent. Napoli go 1-0 down. As always, Maradona saves them. He once again uses his hand. The referee only sees his opponent's foul. It's a penalty, and he's the man to take it. It's his pass again that sends Kareka through to score the winning goal, and the return trip to Germany is the most apprehensive trip for Napoli fans so far, as it coincides with controversial statements made by Maradona that seem to indicate him wanting to leave the club. In short, it's a tense trip. <laughs> When we played the UEFA Cup, we played thanks to Maradona. In the European Cup with Maradona, the cities and nations of Europe, now Maradona allowed us to discover them because it was a good excuse to travel outside of Italy. Here he is, Diego, a champion for all seasons and for all continents. Resign yourselves, Neapolitans, to his tyranny that sometimes seems obsessive and unbearable, but that has changed the history of your city through one of the most popular and universal of phenomena. What does this tyrant do? He welcomes the magic's invitation and executes it. Tutto è pronto per l'inizio di questa partita, 90 minuti di passione, 90 minuti di attese, 90 minuti di speranze, partiti. Colpo di testa di Corradini, la palla perviene a Maradona, Maradona per Alemao, c'è fallo di Catanes, l'arbitro facendo che si può proseguire, c'è un buco per Alemao, Carecca dentro ancora per Alemao, Alemao, tiro e il pallone è in gol! E il pallone va in gol! Everybody says, I remember your goal from a Diego pass. You see, they don't remember my goal, they remember Diego's head pass. Goal! Goal di Ciro Ferrara! Ferrara! Con gran botta, mette dentro! It's one of his instinctive moves that put me in an ideal position to score that time. But then, I did well to score too. 
che vedete Ferrara che non crede ai suoi occhi e ora con una sborgia di gioia e di commozione va a rifugiarsi nell'abbraccio dei compagni ma è bravo anche Carnevale resiste due volte alla carica di Klingsman ottimo Carnevale ottimo anche questo lancio e poi Maradona con una finezza ah, ancora un gran colpo di testa di Klingsman ma è pronto al rilancio per Rara e c'è Maradona che può andare verso la porta Maradona Maradona viene raggiunto da Hartmann Maradona poi serve Careca, Careca, gol! Una vittoria che viene ora sanzionata dal fischio finale dell'arbitro. The triumph in Stuttgart can't erase the bad feelings between Maradona and club chairman Felaino. Their relationship is ruined. The Argentine would like to move to Marseille to enjoy a quieter life. The first rumors about cocaine use emerge. It seems some strained months are ahead. The season before the 1990 World Cup kicks off at the end of August 1989. Maradona stays holed up in Argentina and arrives in Naples only one month later, in poor physical form, overweight and with a renewed tendency to speak his mind against everything and everybody. In 15 days they turned me into a drug addict, mafioso, a gangster. It's very easy to speak negatively about Maradona when he's 15,000 kilometers away. When Maradona came back, none of those who'd said those things turned up. Now somebody here, tell me what I've done to deserve all that's been written in the newspapers. Now, I want to get to the end of this. And then I want to have the last laugh, because until now, everybody else has been laughing but me. His first match is the season's fifth against Fiorentina. Diego wears the number 16 shirt, sits on the bench, and comes on only in the second half, with his team losing 2-0. The fans are all for him. He misses a penalty, but then helps his team to an extraordinary comeback, which results in Napoli winning 3-2. Maradona takes very little time to get back into shape. Two weeks after his seasonal debut, he scores the third goal of a 3-0 defeat of AC Milan, and it's a masterpiece of a goal that allows Napoli to reach the top of the league standings. He strikes again against Inter Milan with a billiard-like shot in the bottom corner. Napoli stay on top, but just as the people of Naples are again worshipping Maradona more than ever, the rest of Italy clearly demonstrates that they've had enough of his continuous, subtly provocative remarks in the press. Tensions run high, and opponents want to defeat Maradona more than they want to defeat Napoli. Every match becomes a personal vendetta. A classic example of this is before Napoli-Juventus, when Tacconi, Juventus' keeper, almost becomes an Italian version of Hugo Gatti, challenging him with these words. He doesn't believe he's God, he believes he's Jesus. Nowadays, he talks about everything as if he alone holds the truth. Tacconi is duly punished with two goals in 15 minutes. The second goal by the Piba de Oro is from a free kick and adds up to a 3-1 victory. We come to the penultimate match of the season. Napoli and AC Milan are level on points at the top of the league. Carica scores. Maradona inspires his team to an easy victory away at Bologna. In Verona, referee Rosario Labello steals the show, sending off many Milan players too easily. AC Milan have to give up all hope of winning the title. Thus, the 1989-90 season sees Napoli winning among a barrage of controversy. The last day of the season is a day of celebration at the San Paolo. Lazio are the opponents Maradona crosses in the ball for the only goal. If possible, the celebrations in Naples are even wilder than three years before. The fans really want to show their attachment to the man that has become their icon. I've seen Maradona, I've seen Maradona, and now, mummy, I'm in love. That was the kind of relationship that there was. I don't know if Maradona had already played for Liverpool.
Italy versus Argentina in Naples, semi-final of the World Cup. It's hard to imagine a match with as much emotional significance, especially after Maradona asks the local fans to support him instead of Italy. We basically already had the ticket ready before playing against Italy. It's true. All the newspapers reported it. Let's be frank about it. Respect for Maradona notwithstanding, Argentina are considered one of the worst teams in this World Cup. That's what the fans say, and also neutral pundits say it. But paradoxes are common in football. They are always to be feared, as they often generate monstrosities. No one is going to kick me out before I play. Secondo le previsioni, gran tifo per l'Italia, qualche fischio all'indirizzo dei giocatori argentini al momento dell'annuncio della formazione, ovazione per Maradona. Giannini, colpo di testa, Vianni, tiro e gol, gol di Schillaci ancora! Despite being weaker, after going one goal down, Argentina find a way to react. Il traversone, l'uscita di Zecca! In extra time, Argentina have a player sent off. The referee, Votro, gives Giusti the red card. Maradona carries his team on and keeps Italy's defence on their toes with one of his trademark runs. Diego holds on, earns some valuable free kicks and tries his best to make time go by as quickly as possible to get to the penalty kicks. Maradona's penalty isn't the decisive one, but his celebration seems to foretell the final result. We managed to reach a state of tranquility, and we equalised thanks to Canigia and then won on penalties, and maybe we were a bit lucky to go through. But yes, I think we willed that victory playing with our hearts. We went through against Brazil. We went through against Italy. FIFA and Italy don't like us. Nobody liked us. Nobody wanted us to leave Italy with the cup in our hands. In the final, the fans, angry because of Italy's defeat, are more hostile than ever towards Maradona, just like they were in Milan for the match against Cameroon and in Turin for the match against Brazil. The whole stadium supports Germany, and Argentina's national anthem is covered with boos and whistles, to which Maradona reacts strongly. We didn't play well against Germany. We would have never scored, even if we played for three days. But they didn't want us to win on penalties like we did uh, against Italy. So the black hand of the referee intervened. The final is clenched by a dubious penalty awarded by the Mexican referee Codesal six minutes from the end. Maradona cries like a child. Not even his tears endear him to the crowd at the Olimpico Stadium. His magnified face is beamed on all the big screens. The king cries, but there's no mercy for him, only booing. And we ask ourselves, is this the Olimpico or the Colosseum? Maradona's stay with Napoli comes to a close before the end of the 1990-91 season. Diego is found positive at a drug test after the match against Bari. The verdict is clear, it's cocaine. 15 months suspension. Yeah, for sure, that was a bad thing for Napoli. Bad, first of all, for him and certainly for the whole club as well. We all felt a bit like orphans, mainly because he left so suddenly to go back to Argentina. And unfortunately, to this day, he's never been back to Naples.
Less than a month after returning to Argentina, he is arrested in Buenos Aires, accused of holding and selling cocaine. After his suspension, he plays unremarkably for Seville in Spain and Newell's old boys in his home country. But the legend is resurrected in time for the 1994 World Cup in the USA. Sulla sfera ora redondo, Maradona buono, l'1-2, stupenda l'azione dell'Argentina, ancora Maradona al limite, il tiro e il gol! Every problem seems to fade away in front of the TV camera that captures his angry cry of release during Argentina, Greece. The man is back at the top, where he belongs. That mixture of heaven and hell, arrogance and humbleness, vice and sacrifice was beautiful, fascinating, irresistible. And then suddenly Diego was back, at the age of Christ, with his genius still intact, his tyrannical power, his terrible anathemas, and his left foot on fire, like the sword of an angel. We were all enchanted. Maradona's World Cup is over after just two matches. He tests positive for ephedrine, a medicine that isn't allowed, and is suspended for another 15 months and, in essence, kicked out of football's elite. But Diego makes another comeback and manages to end his career playing for his beloved Boca Juniors. On the 25th of October 1997, he plays his last official match at the Monumental Stadium against River Plate. In January 2001, he's hospitalized in Uruguay following a cardiac arrest, and immediately afterwards, he starts a long detox program in Cuba. On the 10th of October 2001, he plays for the very last time, celebrating the end of his career at nearly 41 years of age, with an exhibition match at the Bombonera Boca Stadium, his home. Maradona's legend lives on. His is a story that keeps inspiring people of all ages. I'm a great supporter of Napoli because many years ago Maradona used to play for them. Maradona is the best. He's got great calves, he's very quick, he knows how to dribble very well and he has curly black hair. I'd like to see him play again. I've only ever seen him on video. <laughs> In training, you could see the real Maradona, and it was quite a spectacle. He never lost a practice match. He did things with tremendous ease. He did them, he made you feel incredibly small because he's got such fantastic skills. He always trained with the ball. It was difficult to see him running without the ball. And in any case, even if sometimes he didn't come to training, when he did come, he was really motivated. You could see he really wanted to stay on the pitch, even sometimes when it was flooded or very, very muddy. He used to throw himself about in the mud and have a laugh with his teammates. And sometimes he even used to play in goal. 
When he came to the ground, you could see he was a really happy man. And obviously, this made us happy too, because every day was like a new discovery. I've never seen such things. In training, during warm-up, I've never seen anyone else do those things. Unfortunately, what us teammates saw, the crowd couldn't see, the fans couldn't see, because during the week it was a completely different thing. I mean, you realize that what you saw during the week was unrepeatable. I miss those years where I could continue to learn, and I, well, I say that from experience. You could see that he was light on the pitch, very light.
Uh, the defenders uh, treated me harshly all the time, and that was their job. And this is what I carry with me throughout my whole career. Diego certainly had this peculiarity that he never complained about a tackle or a bad foul against him. He had this stocky body, but he was explosive, impressive, a ball. He was like a ball. He was like a ball because when he fell over, he leapt right up again. Instead of feet, well, he's got hands. He was also very acrobatic. Maybe it was his height, but he was able to move in small spaces and could still do some spectacular stuff. I've seen him play with the outside of his foot, in step, inner part of the foot, his back heel, Lorabona. The bicycle kick. I've seen him do everything, every possible play imaginable. Tunnel between the other guy's legs. I have a sombrero, as we say. It's a hat for us. And we do like this and we stop it on the other side. Uh, penalty kicks. 
penalty kicks are good if you score them because no one in the world can say he's going to score. It's uh, very, very difficult. Now, I've missed a lot of penalties and they saved a lot of them, but I've also scored plenty. I used to wait for the keeper, but I had to kick the ball and the keeper has to stop it. Now, it depends. Some stop with their mind, some stop a little more. As I'm seeing the keeper, I, I can't hit it too hard because I'm already on top of the ball. Well, the run-up with my foot, well, it isn't enough to hit the ball hard. Now, if it goes slowly, it's knowing if the keeper's going to jump to the right or keep to his left. And generally, I manage to win in these things because I do this. I extend the leg and I watch the keeper. But mm, you risk not getting the ball there though. Yet I manage pretty well usually. I don't know where to put the ball. And, and the farthest away from the keeper. Well, that's why I scored a great many goals above the wall. But when the keeper was sly and went towards the ball before my run-up, went over the wall, well, that is, behind the wall, I usually, uh, I usually hit it towards his post. I knew some keepers could be really sly. No? So then... I scored on the keeper's post, and then the keeper, once he's behind the wall waiting for the ball to go over, when the ball stays here, it's a certain goal. Uh, I mean, he can't go back, he's made his choice. He can't go back. You can improve on that. No, you can improve. With weekly training, you can. I spent a long time with keepers trying out free kicks.
Juventus and Napoli, two clubs that have had in their lineups the two greatest creative players that world football has ever expressed, Omar Sivari and Diego Armando Maradona. Both number 10s, both of them natural left foot players, both cabezons. Sivori was maybe more cynical, more irreverent towards his opponents. Maradona was more practical and undoubtedly he was more geared towards scoring. In Italy, Diego played exclusively for Napoli, Omar in both clubs, Juventus and Napoli, even if he did give his best with the former club. Here's how Sivori at Juventus punished Napoli. A goal on the 12th of October 1958. Three goals, one of them on penalty on the 17th of April 1960. And three goals on the 21st of May 1961. And here's Maradona's reply, 3rd of November 1985, an indirect free kick of rare beauty. A penalty on the 13th of December 1987. And two goals on the 25th of March 1990. Today, Sivari and Maradona won't be on the pitch. Let's hope we don't regret this too much. No, no, I don't want to sing. What I want to do is to talk about all the happiness that I feel at this moment. I want to thank the team. I want to thank the chairman. I want to thank everybody for having given me, as a foreigner, and to Antonio and Alamao, the fact of, of getting to win this Scudetto, this shield. I want to thank, as captain, well, I feel proud of everybody, and that's all.